Hi everybody, John Han with the Pulsing Cinema again. Thought I'd do an update video here and uh, give a little review of Endangered Fest 2 uh, here to place in February 20th, uh, 2015. Uh, I'm, it's, it's been a little, a little while, it's been a, a few days since Endangered Fest, but I thought I would just go on and uh, give a quick review of the, the proceedings before it fades from the memory. I don't think it'll fade from the memory for a long time, because it really, again, was another really memorable uh, movie marathon. What is the Endangered Fest? Uh, what is the what is AGFA? Check out my first video, which was the review of the initial Enda Endangered Fest in 2013. Uh, this is the sequel to that movie marathon. Uh, Agfa, just to give you a thumbnail sketch, is the American Genre Film Archive, which is a film archive for uh, genre films. Uh, you know, strange as that may may seem, given the title, <laughs> genre. Uh, they're a, a film archive. They're a nonprofit film archive for genre films for Grindhouse uh, horror exploitation. You know, Grindhouse, uh, Weird House, Any House. Uh, if it's there's only if there's only a few prints in the world, uh, Agfa's probably got one. The Endangered Fest uh, is a film festival put on by Agfa uh, in association with uh, Chris Bajali's uh, blog, formerly Fanzine, The Temple of Schlock. Uh, and I met Chris Bajali, I met Lars, uh, and uh, you know, met met a few of the other people there uh, who uh, you know. At the film fest, it was it was a great vibe. It seemed like a lot of the original people from the original film fest uh, in um, in 2013 had shown back up. They were ready for more, and uh, it was it, it was in a, the first film festival, the uh, uh, Endangered Fest one, took place downtown Austin at the uh, Draft House Ritz. This one was at the Marchesa Theater, the Austin Film Society Marchesa Theater, which is a little more of a smaller venue uh, and a little more grindhouse -y. It was, I think it was a little more appropriate for uh, this, this kind of event. And uh, it also took place a little bit earlier because it started at, at uh, 7 p.m., whereas the original Endangered Fest started from like 1 a.m. to God knows how much. This, this one actually ended at about 2.45 in the morning, so it was... It was a, at a ridiculous late time, but it wasn't like uh, crazy. It, the sun wasn't coming up uh, as, as we were uh, leaving the, the theater. Uh, Chris Pajali said that you know the original Endangered Fest was was more of a 42nd Street type vibe, and this one was more of a drive-in vibe uh, to it. And and I could agree to, agree with that uh, to a great extent. Uh, and I think this Endangered Fest was a little more of a deep. Deep cuts in Danger Fest. I mean, there was some really, uh, you know, kind of odd, you know, obscure stuff here that, um, and I and I think it was just as, as it was really well programmed, as, as well programmed as the first one, and it was a little more of a progression that I, you know, because I, I think because um, from the first film to you know, it was just like a. a <laughs> until the end uh so four films uh they sh we show the first film was uh matt simber's calliope aka love is catching a uh a early 70s sex comedy uh of, kind of in the style of arthur schnitzler's schnitzler's play la ronde where it's just it's um the structure of it is a cycle where it's just basically about uh, uh, vignettes with these different couples who are in in sexual positions and and the one of the members of the couple goes and is part of the next scene so you know the, the, the first scene is a, uh, a a groupie and a rock star and then uh, it it goes into the the groupie having sex with his with her her uh, manager at this uh, cool looking uh, vintage uh, scuzzy uh, Pier One Imports <laughs> or an early seventies Pier One Imports uh, and then it goes from the the, the manager of Pier One Imports having a little tryst with a housewife and then it goes from the housewife to the uh, to the um, uh, older uh, golf playing husband who can barely get it up in bed and then he he meets uh, this hippie chick who's in this kind of juice fruit cult which is kind of reminds me of like the family the those family restaurants in the 70s it's kind of one of those vibes 
and then uh, she's uh, uh, sleeping with a, a, a black power guy, and the black power guy is out on the beach and meets this Jane Mansfield looking chick, uh, and um, Jane Mansfield's chick is trying to have sex with the the uh, uh, Daryl Goldsack, the uh, the famed producer, in order to, to gain favor with him, and then. Daryl Goldsack is is having sex with the original groupie, uh, in well the, the groupie from the thing. So it's again a, a big circle, and it's just kind of trying to present a panorama of '70s sexual situations from groupies and rock stars and house frustrated housewives and old men and producers, you know, and all this stuff. And I mean, it, it's definitely a Matt Simber. I, I, I would agree with Lars. It really fits within Matt Simber's filmography very well. It's um, uh, kind of a pair, you know, Matt Simber would do these films which were kind of like, like the Candy Tangerine Man, which are kind of like knockoffs or parodies of the film, but he wouldn't watch the original film. So he, he, he was, it was just this weird, strange misfire full of all these crazy characters and these ant whacked out performances and and it was good so I mean it felt like a, a bunch of lost episodes of Love American Style I mean it was a very very much a, an early 70s time capsule type type film uh, so that was the first film uh, <clears throat> uh, the second film was a low budget early 70s biopic of Lenny Bruce called Dirty Mouth, directed by Herbert Altman, uh, starring Bernie Travis as uh, Lenny Bruce, uh, and uh, don't really know much about Herbert Altman, don't know much about Bernie Travis from what I look at the IMDb, or Herb, uh, Bernie Travis didn't seem like he had much of a career, it looks like he died in 1984, looks like there's a, 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 tra a, a, a tragic story behind uh, behind Bernie Travis but you know the film starts out kind of a little bit uh, you know on a on a weird note where it's like it 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 takes it takes some of the early stuff um, uh, from later in the film and puts it up in the front and and it's and it, and it feels like just kind of cobbled together and there's the and it and the film it kind of tracks the the rise and fall of Lenny Bruce from the early clubs to the success uh, into the 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 pit of, of drug abuse and uh, legal problems, which consumed his life and caused him to to uh, to you know kill himself with with drugs and, and overdose. And I and I kind of knew that the outline of of, uh, of Lenny Bruce's life and the, the kind of adulation that he had from the comedians of the 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 eighties and the nineties. Uh, so. And then I, I, but I never seen the Bob Fosse uh, uh, Lenny film, which is a big deficit in my uh, movie uh, fan life. But in, in any case, uh, as I was saying before, the film kind of started off on a weird note where you almost felt like this is going to be some kind of knockoff, you know, grindhouse like uh, half-ass version of Lenny Bruce's life. But then it just develops, and the love story between Lenny Bruce. And Iris, who um, looks like a very young Susan Strasberg. It's not Susan Strasberg. It's um, I don't know. It's this actress who was this. Uh, I forget her name. She was a um, mainly was a uh, 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 a soap actress. She became a soap actress, but she is really great in it. And I mean, the, um, Bernie Travis. He, he bears a, a, a slight resemblance to Lenny Bruce, but he, I think vocally he is, you know, you could close your eyes and most of the time it, it sounds almost exactly like Lenny Bruce. I mean, according to Bajali's intro, this guy was doing Lenny Bruce bits, comedy bits in uh, comedy clubs in New York and it, and, it, and it seems like definitely this guy could could do it he has that force of personality and and there is a, a there is a, such a an earnestness to this film if this film was made in the mid 90s it would have been like uh, maybe a critically acclaimed little tiny uh, an indie film picked up by Miramax but I mean in the early 70s uh, it, it the film I don't know if there was really a, a place for it, it it's uh, definitely kind of a, an off-the-wall film where, where people were still trying to come to grips with with what Lenny Bruce was and what his comedy meant and what his legacy was 
Uh, and so, and also there was the 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 people behind uh, the the eventual Fosse movie and the the stage play and everything, and people who had rights to Lenny Bruce's material sued the the filmmakers behind Dirty Mouth. So this film was very very obscure. Uh, but yeah, I mean, really a treat, really something that's like so off the wall, and it's just like you've never heard of this film, but you know suddenly. Uh, it's how, oh, oh, and also a young Danny Aiello, which I don't think anybody uh, mentioned uh, at the Endangered Fest. A young Danny Aiello is in one of the uh, one of the club scenes of this film, and he starts uh, chatting up uh, that uh, that chick who was in um, Lenny Bruce's uh, Lenny Bruce's uh, act. So that that was like whoa whoa Danny Aiello is obviously Danny Aiello, but I don't think anybody mentioned it. Uh, third film was Things to Come, uh, not uh, The Shape of Things to Come, not Alexander Korda's like classic you know H.G. Wells film. This was like a uh, late I think it was 1976 uh, film made in South Texas, I think around San Antonio, um, a sci-fi sex comedy of of some sort uh it, it was like imagine like um logan's run and put a little bit of Westworld in there and uh, then put a little bit of like thx 1138 and uh then um like put some stag films <laughs> in there it was, it was like, like what the hell is going on with this movie? The movie starts off with like this softcore like stag scene of this of this dude in this room. He rips off this woman's clothes. She's totally naked. He starts whipping her with a belt. He ties her hands behind her back, and and then he cuts to this this sci-fi looking guy in a in this futuristic uh, uniform on a couch watching this stuff. And so then we're introduced to the world of things to come, which is this uh, sci-fi utopia, yeah, kind of vaguely like Logan's Run. The, the, the costumes, I think, were really inspired by Logan's Run, the Cheap Jack television series Logan's Run, maybe not the theatrical film. Uh, but it's this futuristic world where uh, People only have to work three three months a year. The rest of the time, they can uh, they can just uh, lay out. Uh, and uh, the only thing on television are these like um, really weird sex and violence uh, vignettes, uh, which you know curiously look like uh, you know seventies uh, type softcore uh, stag film things because it seems like they. They were just cut into this film, uh, you know, uh, mercilessly. So, uh, and that's everyone only watches that stuff in order to uh, pacify uh, and control them. And so there is this. So, this, so the, the film starts off with this uh, husband and wife. Uh, they are watching these films, and the the wife is uh, unbeknownst to the husband part of this underground. Uh, resistance who is trying to 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 fight this and um, every week there is a a state raffle where the winners of the raffle a state lottery sorry state lottery get to go to this pleasure dome which is kind of like a west world where everyone lives out their their sexual uh, dreams and so uh, the this uh, young wife uh, wins that and she gets to go to the pleasure dome and but she's uh, her her underground controllers have tasked her with uh, blowing up the computer that runs the pleasure dome in order to try to wake people up uh, and uh, power to the people. So then we get to the pleasure dome, and instead of some guy watching uh, a stag scene on a television, now you get like this controller in this computer room uh, watching scenes of uh, people like being whipped with with chain guys being tied up and being whipped by naked women and and like death sport where it's like David Carradine's like Death Race 2000 death sport where where um, these guys are running around on these motorbikes while they're chasing down these uh, uh, oh 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 and the um, the pleasure dome is staffed by these pleasure robots that are supposed to do you know whatever you like and engage and indulge and allow you to indulge in any kind of sexual fantasy 
so uh yeah and so she she finds her way through this futuristic world and and there's a big uh soil green is made in a people thing at the end and uh it's um yeah, it's 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 really crazy. Really happy. The film started off weird. I mean, the print quality of the film um, was like it. It felt like if Joe Dante was going to make a parody of like a sex film, like a, a sex sci-fi movie, like he would make this type of thing because it almost looked like film looked. It looked like a very clean film, uh, and then like there was like. Uh, lines like overlaid on the top of it. Now the later reels look like vintage retro 1976, you know, drive-in sci-fi sex movie stuff. But the but the the early reels were really weird and they were like almost too clean and it was, it was like a I don't know maybe it was just late at night and all the sugar or just starting to hallucinate this stuff. But uh, <laughs> and according to the to uh, Lars the um, one of the guys who was in this film, I think one of the, maybe the stunt guys in the, uh, the, uh, motorbike scenes, motorbike death sport scenes, his family actually rented out a theater and they're like, Hey, my dad was in a movie. And they actually watched this movie in a rented out Alamo draft. <laughs> they rented this printed and showed it and watched it at the Alamo draft house, the whole fam, man, they must've been in for a surprise with all this. You know, I mean, the, the first scene is, it's just, just wacko, you know, like, sex and bondage scene and it goes it's like it was a wild movie final movie was blood pen which was actually a kind of a cheat because it's just a retitling of pigs uh the mark lawrence film i'd never seen pigs blood pen was a, a retitling in order to take advantage of the exorcist and i think there's a retitle of a retitle of a ret it has it starts off with a scene of a uh, of a priest exercising a woman who is uh, possessed with a demonic swine. And so it's the first scene and, and then it goes into the regular pigs. Very atmospheric horror film, a backwoods psychodrama, you know, ver very much like uh, Three on a Meat Hook or, you know, like Motel Hell, like, not like Motel Hell. I, I think it, it reminds me more like Three on a Meat Hook, where it's like, but much, much, more well made than Three on a Meat Hook, you know, and and uh, I'd never seen it before. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty uh, well known horror film, and I think there's been some rights disputes on it in recent years. But in, in any case, uh, Mark Lawrence is just great in it, and his his daughter, I guess Tony Lawrence, is the the lead actress in it. She looks like a very much like a young Talia Shire. So it's just very much people with hidden pasts and uh, feeding people the pigs and. Brutality. I mean, there's a, probably a billion reviews of uh, pigs online. So in any case, uh, th that's that's what it was. The Endangered Fest Two. I think a great, uh, another great group of uh, four films, and it's something really I think should be done every year. It's such a great thing. There's so many weird unknown films, probably in the in the uh, Agfa coffers that you could uh, you know drag this thing out every year. You could probably do this stuff, and it would be a lot cool. But in any case, there there it is, another milestone of uh, of uh, an obscure cinema, uh, the uh, the Endangered Fest Two, a, a great show.